Well, we couldn't have had a more appropriate set of Bible texts for today, could we? For any of us who have had more than a passing interest in the political life of our nation, it has been a week fraught with anxiety on top of anxiety. In Amos's words, you can almost hear him saying, and if this wasn't bad enough, try this. It is darkness, not light, as if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. As the psalmist says, be pleased, O God, to deliver us. O Lord, make haste to help us. For those of us who have struggled the most, even struggled at a life and death level with the twin pandemics of COVID and racial injustice, Amos's prophecy is resonant. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. It has felt like we're living in apocalyptic times when good and evil are contending and evil has had or is close to having the upper hand. Our passage from the Gospel of Matthew today is one of Jesus's own apocalyptic statements about the coming of the end of days when God will judge the world. The bridesmaids and their lamps are, of course, a metaphor, which we also often hear in Advent when we await the birth of our Lord, a metaphor for remaining vigilant as we wait for the dawning of the kingdom of heaven, God's restoring of justice and peace on the earth. We know when the gospels are quoting Jesus about the end of times that he's pleading with the people to live justly so that they will be saved when the oppressors, in his day, the heavy hand of the Roman empire, are finally put down. The gospel for today is a warning for our times. Don't be complacent. Don't wait for a more convenient moment. Don't be co-opted by the powers of those who would rob the poor of their dignity and their lives. Don't fall asleep. Keep your lamps lit. We might say, keep your capacity for thinking, for illumination, awake and alert. Our presiding Bishop Michael Curry and Rabbi Sharon Brous of the Ikar Congregation in Los Angeles were on the Today Show earlier this week, and Bishop Curry spoke eloquently about the need for healing in our nation and for love and justice to be restored. He spoke about the Latin phrase on the great seal of the United States that serves as a motto for the country, e pluribus unum, which means out of many, one. The origins of the motto, he said, are believed to have come from the writings of the ancient Roman scholar Cicero. Cicero in his writings said, when each person loves the other as much as he loves himself, then out of one, many becomes possible. We have to ask ourselves, what am I willing to do to make e pluribus unum real? From many, one? What am I going to do today, he says, that's going to bring this nation together, bring us together as a human community? And they both talked about the importance of building relationships across difference and how even some of our most personal relationships have been strained in this divisive time. Rabbi Brous said in the Mishnah, which was written almost 2,000 years ago, there's a teaching that says that the world rests on three things, on justice, on truth, and on peace. In this incredibly fraught moment, there's no shortcut to peace, she says. We can't say, can't we just all get along? What we need is to build a just society, and the way to justice is through truth-telling. And when we are honest about where the mistakes are, where the pain points are, where the white supremacist ideology is, that is really at the foundation of this country and what it would really take to root that out and to honor and affirm the dignity of every single person in this country. Then, she says, we can start to rebuild relationships and start to walk toward healing. But you can't just skip those steps. You can't just hold hands and sing together and everything will be okay. This country is deeply, deeply broken and wounded from a past of incredible violence and trauma. She says, we have to find a new narrative together that can hold us all so that we can truly become a multiracial democracy, the multi-faith democracy that lifts up and affirms every single one of us. Now, many people I know have been talking about the importance of trying to heal the divisiveness we are experiencing right now in America. And how can we learn to talk with each other again across differences of opinion? 
this sounds good, even if it sounds maybe a little too aspirational right now, given all the rancor that has occurred really since the election in 2016. How will we ever get back to e pluribus unum? Our theology in both the Old and New Testaments is a theology of justice and love for the neighbor. But I'll say something now that might sound a little shocking coming from a priest, even in this virtual pulpit. I don't think talking theology in and of itself is going to get us where we need to go. Why doesn't truth telling just work? Why are some people so captivated by even the most blatant lies that come out of the mouths of certain political leaders? We can understand this when people only listen to one TV news channel and only hear the same ideas in the echo chamber of their friends on Facebook and other social media. It is possible to live in an ideological bubble, and that's true for the left as well as the right. But with a pandemic raging in some of the states and towns where that thought bubble says, don't wear a mask, COVID's just a hoax, it will go away. How is such a bubble maintained in the face of raw facts on the ground? And then there's also the perennial question, why do people vote against their own self-interest? Charles Blow wrote it in an editorial piece earlier this week, how is it possible that 18% of black men and 28%, yes, 28% of LGBTQ people voted for President Trump in this year's election, as did a plurality of white women. I realize that for some, the abortion issue is the single issue that matters. And for them, they will vote for the candidate who will most likely overturn Roe versus Wade. And for them, this is a matter of deep, even sacred principle, and the ends justify the means. But for many others, as Blow writes, quote, all of this to me points to the power of the white patriarchy and the coattail it has of those who depend on it or aspire to it. It reaches across gender and sexual orientation and even race. Trump's brash, privileged, chest thumping and alpha male dismissiveness and in your face rudeness are aspirational to some men and appealing to some women. Some people who have historically been oppressed will stand with oppressors and will aspire to power by proximity. For poor and working class white men and many white women, this goes all the way back to the 17th century when fearing a revolution among all servants, black and white, wealthy men of power essentially bought off indentured white servants with a promise that they could earn their freedom and rise in status as members of a superior race while enslaved Africans were held down as a permanent underclass with no rights. Jim Crow laws and mass incarceration have perpetuated this structural and deeply ingrained racism that says, I may be poor, but at least I'm not one of them. This false sense of dignity was founded without realizing its origins on this 17th century feat of social engineering the feminist movement and civil rights movement's advances for women and persons of color have been destabilizing this assumed sense of superiority since the 1960s. And although the resentment has been simmering under the surface for decades, the 2016 presidential election unleashed a torrent of overt racism. It also unleashed xenophobia against immigrants, sexism and heterosexism, and all too often wrapped in the banner of Christian evangelicalism. The corrupt and exploitive promise made to white men in the earliest days of the American colonies as a strategy of divide and conquer was nevertheless a promise by which generations of poor and working class men have lived, struggled, and found a sense of dignity. And as these foundations have begun to crumble, many feel betrayed. It was that false sense of dignity built on the denigration of others. But the liberal church's calls for justice and diversity precisely threaten that sense of dignity, false though it is. For the many who cling openly and unapologetically to white supremacy, President Trump has been a hero. Despite his wealth, they say he's one of us because he tells it like it is. When Trump says, make America great again, he means make America white again. And even more psychologically compelling, make you great again. 
His threats of lawsuits and accusations of a stolen election resonate with his most ardent supporters because they too feel something has been stolen from them and they want justice. They want their shaky sense of superiority to be restored. Maybe, just maybe, we are now at a crossroads where healing can begin. How can we engage as people of faith in real meaningful dialogue with persons, maybe still almost half our nation and many of our own family and friends who believe their dignity has been stolen and in their identification with Donald Trump, they had hoped to regain it? In our baptismal covenant in the Episcopal Church, we pledge to strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being. How can we not just talk, but actually show by the way we live our lives that diversity is a better way for everyone? That we are all enriched by our differences rather than threatened? How can we show by the way we live our lives and relate to others that dignity doesn't come either through muscular displays of supremacy and masculinity or through self-righteous virtue signaling, but in the way we conduct ourselves? showing sincerity, grace, and a willingness to admit when we are wrong. How can we walk the walk and not just talk the talk of that white supremacy is a tissue of lies that hurts everyone in society, including those who cling to it? And in what ways have we, the liberal church, also been captive to our own brand of defensive authority, our own unacknowledged sexism and racism, what do we fear that true diversity beyond Kumbaya might take away from us that we don't wanna give up? We have a long path ahead of us to restore the soul of our badly damaged nation after this national election. There are years of harm now to repair and many lies to be unraveled. But I place my hope in the resilience and common decency that is also a part of our shared narrative as Americans, and in Abraham Lincoln's appeal to the better angels of our nature. Lincoln wrote, we must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic chords of memory will yet swell the chorus of the union when again touched as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. In God's eyes, everyone has dignity the true dignity of being God's beloved, every last one of us. As children of God, we find our true dignity and can walk together by love, not fear. Then justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Amen.